Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organisers for the invitation. So this isn't going to be about a specific research project, although they conduct research into climate change and specifically schistosomiasis as a topic. Uh, but I thought I'd try and open the session with giving an overview of some of the challenges I think that we face as societies trying to mitigate or adapt to climate change. And I've called it from uncertainty to adaptive interventions. As you'll see as we go along, we don't know what the future looks like, so how do we deal with it? If you want to get in touch afterwards, there's various ways you can do that as listed there. So um, this is a popular meme that you will see used by NGOs in the charity sector, also DFID and other large organisations and WHO and individuals. I use it in my uh, social media to suggest that we are on our way to beating NTDs. And there's a number of roadmap targets. If you're familiar with the literature, you will know about them and specific dates that are being set. Where do they come from, you might ask. I might ask that as well. I do frequently and don't know the answer. Uh, but apparently by 2030, 40 or 50, it's always a decadal time frame, uh, we will have got rid of some of them. But I, as a researcher, feel duty bound to put a question mark against that because we cannot see into the future. If anybody can see into the future, please put your hand up. Exactly. We can't. So we don't know what's coming and we know what's been. So retrospectively, we can say, well, it worked then. But will it work in the future? And I think that's the question we all have to ask ourselves. Now, it's a challenging area and funding is tight, but I thought I'd enlist the help of a funder because some of the questions that are, they ask, we have to be able to answer. So, um, funder, are you online? Yes. <laughs> now, this obviously isn't the real Bill Gates. It's just a simulation of a generic funder using a Creative Commons image of Bill Gates as a generic funder. Any likeness is uh, circumstantial, uh, and we'll call him Bill just for convenience. So Bill will be asking some questions, which I'll try and answer through this. Okay, uh, over to you, Bill. Oh yes, it's a success story, says Bill, because we've heard of many successes recently. If you go to various NGO websites, they'll tell you. And if you look at the, uh, some projects that have been undertaken, some interventions, here's some data from uh, China, in fact. And look at what's happened in China to the number of cases. On the left-hand side, you can see two lines, patients and acute cases since 2005 to 2014, a very integrated approach, removing people from the source of infection, particularly ca cattle, and people from the source of infection in the Chinese uh, situation has brought down the, uh, the prevalence of schistosomiasis considerably. And other NTDs, there are success stories that are coming out regularly, month by month. We see elimination stories. This goes back a few years, in fact, not just for 2018. There's a number of uh, success, public health success stories around the elimination, for example, of trachoma and lymphatic filariasis. But note that they are just two of many possible NTDs. And the NTD list from WHO is not what you would call comprehensive. There is also a WHO R&D priority list, arguably they're all. NTDs. And what about the 300 and something zoonotic diseases around as well, that we, some of which we know nothing about at all? Disease X, for example, what is it? So, there you go, Bill, what do you say to that? What exactly is the problem? Well, I've just sort of tried to outline it. We don't know the future. Uh, let me try and explain it to you. First of all, we're living in what's known as the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is where humans are having an unprecedented influence on the earth and social systems around them. We're also living in a time that has been termed the Great Acceleration. You can see from this graph why that might be the case. These are all sorts of indicators from social systems, from earth systems, that things are changing. Just look at the shape of all those curves. And it's on a timeline. Each of those graphs goes from the 1700s to the 2000s. Give you some examples. So, international tourism, ramped up. People are moving around the world in unprecedented numbers for tourism. Populations are growing rapidly. Now, you may have heard recently about, actually, fertility rates going down, but that's only in certain countries. The population of Africa is certainly going up, for example, sub-Saharan Africa. Urbanisation is increasing rapidly as people move into cities to find employment and live different lives. And, of course, the bogeyman of climate change, CO2, concentration has been ramping up uh, to unprecedented levels and keeps growing year on year on year. And that's just a few of many other indicators. So there's a lot happening, and that's happening now. That's not happening in the future. That is looking retrospectively up till now, and things are therefore changing quite rapidly. On top of that, oh, what was that? 
uh, flooding. So extreme weather events are also ramping up. On top of that, we have long-term trends. Now, this climate change issue is, is sometimes interpreted differently depending on who you're talking to. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change thinks of climate change over a decadal, multi-decadal timescale. Look at this graph here. It's projecting from 1980 to 2100. Not many governments think to 2100. But you can also see something else in here, and this is that the data from the past are fixed and invariant, because we know what happened. But as soon as you look into the future, it becomes uncertain. And notice how, as you go further into the future, the number of potential climate change scenarios, this is to do with uh, emissions, CO2 emissions, which leads to temperature variations and anomalies over the years, various different pathways that you can follow. This is where we want to be. That's possibly where we'll end up in current uh, projections. But it's the uncertainty I think I want to draw your attention to. We really don't know where we're going to be by 2040, let alone 2060, and we're even more uncertain about 2100. We could be anywhere. So given that's the case, why can we be so certain that by 2020 or 2040, we're going to eliminate these NTDs, which are nearly all environmentally sensitive. They're sensitive to climate parameters. They, their life cycles contain elements that are going to be affected by their environment. Yes, so it's scary. But what does it have to do with combating NTDs when we know what already works? We do know what works. It's, it's a public health story. We know that giving people access to medicine will help treat them. We know what the preventive measures are because the life cycles have been described, so we know how, how to interrupt the life cycles. So we can just go ahead and carry on. And if you read the WHO roadmaps, they say that it's the right thing to do is to carry on on this course that we've set ourselves until the job is done. So we could just keep going back and giving people medicines in these communities and doing other interventions, and that would help. But let me draw your attention, this is partly for the engineers, I put this in at the last minute, to this complex life cycle of one particular parasitic infection, schistosomiasis. You've heard about this already today. I don't want you to look at the life cycle so much, but at the different phases. There is a water phase. In that water phase, there are free living larvae, Myricidae and Sicarii, from the parasite itself, and there are snails that carry the parasite. So those snails are affected by the water parameters, the water temperature, pH, the conductivity, etc., and the free living stages are differentially affected. Those snails are predated on by fish, which also are affected by the temperature of the water. The fish are predated on by birds, which are affected by climate, and so on and so on. So outside of this, there's all sorts of things happening. The people themselves are affected by climate change directly and indirectly, and what happens inside them, of course, is controlled by the internal uh, mechanisms of the host. So it's really how people interact with their environment and how the environment affects the climate sensitive stages of the parasite in that complex life cycle that has lots of indirect influences. That's why it's tricky to think about how the climate might affect the transmission of these infections. Let me give you one example from some uh, data collected in a project I supervised. This is about how water temperature affects the fecundity and the thriving of those intermediate host snails. Bionflora sedanica is a host for Schistosoma mansoni. We have three graphs here, all of them show the same kind of curve, showing water temperature in an artificial bath situation against some measure of egg production, as indicated on the bottom. It's not a linear line. It's not linear, is it? it the eggs don't go up with temperature. The number of eggs produced peaks at about 22, 23 degrees and goes down. So how is this relevant to climate change? Supposing there's an area where the water is quite cool, it might be a lake at altitude that gets warmer, it becomes more suitable for the snails. Now, what about snails that currently live in an area that's quite warm, a stream, a pond, or a river that's already quite warm, and it gets a bit warmer, those snail populations will crash. So we see that a monotonic increase in temperature might have a very differential effect, depending on the starting point of the location where that temperature is rising. If it's cool, the temperature goes up, it becomes more suitable. If it's already warm, the temperature goes up, it might become unsuitable. And there's more. Um, I would advise that you read this uh, paper here if you're interested. This is uh, data that comes from wildlife studies looking at environmental change, anthropogenic change in particular, causing stress on parasites and host life cycles and systems, a response from the parasites. We have evidence from wildlife studies that many parasites 
have plasticity and adaptability built into their life cycles so they can cope with environmental change and rain shifts. There's genetic diversity, there's increase and decrease host specificity possible in parasites of animals. There's no reason to suppose it couldn't happen for medically important parasites of people. And then the effects could be all sorts. They could be that the parasites evolved due to various selection pressures brought about by the medicines themselves. They, uh, the hosts could migrate, the intermediate hosts could migrate or be translocated passively. There's many things that could be happening and we can't capture them all. Therefore, we have uncertainty. Added to that, we ha oh dear. The, uh, this is a map of um, Africa and uh, the Americas. You can see that there are a number of arrows on here. This is from some data that I reported on in this article here about climate change and NTDs. It shows climate-induced migrations. It is a contested issue because it's very difficult to attribute a particular migration event to, a cli to climate change. But these are all on the back of extreme weather events like flooding and drought. And it's known that that forces people to become displaced. And so this is uh, lines of displacement from West Africa to Europe and to the Americas. Now, of course, if they're living in a schistoendemic area, for example, this could lead to outbreaks of schistosomiasis elsewhere. And in fact, that's what's happening. So there are a number of reports of imported cases of schistosomiasis becoming established. Here's one. There's another, an outbreak of schistosomiasis in Brazil, in a non-endemic area of Brazil, uh, Belo Horizonte. Now we know that schistosomiasis has been endemic, but it's been controlled and it comes back occasionally. And then the, most recently, the outbreak in Corsica, which is an imported uh, epidemic, and so on. And in Italy as well. So we're seeing reports of outbreaks which are attributed to people arriving in particular locations with their infection. So they're not being accessed by these mass drug administration campaigns that are very popular inside uh, endemic areas. So to summarise that bit, I think, again, we can think about something like an increased global temperature, global warming as it's often known, leads to, in some areas, improving the habitat, in other areas not, might be diminishing the habitat by making it too hot. Too much drought is bad for many parasite life cycles. Decreased precipitation, for example, drought, can lead to food and water security issues and force migration and therefore translocation. On the other hand, there might be mitigation and adaptation that reduce the frequency of contacts between humans and vectors and zoonotic hosts and so forth. An increased regional precipitation, which is another factor associated with climate change, could also lead to uh, selection pressures on the host and the vectors, but also asynchrony and so forth. So monotonic increases or decrease in some of these climate factors could work both ways. It's a double-edged sword, resulting in some areas where transmission has increased and some areas where it's actually decreased. OK, says Bill, what would I like to do about it? Well, this is how we move from uncertainty to adaptation in one slide. Now, this was published in Trends in Parasitology, so you can go there and read it if you have access to that particular journal. And this is about rethinking a little bit where we need to go in the near term to cope with what is basically a fragmented and uncertain future. It comes back to some basic public health principles about surveillance. Now, mass drug administration programs and preventive chemotherapy is called the cornerstone of control. But really, we should be thinking about the cornerstone of prevention especially as we go into what's been known as the end game or elimination, and that is surveillance. So what I'm suggesting here, and what we're suggesting here, is that we have to be location specific because many of these diseases, as I've suggested, are going to be translocated and what happens in one region won't happen in another. And there are many things that might happen, as indicated here. Increased rainfall, decreased rainfall. Uh, other anthropogenic changes, for example, leading to dam construction because of water use shortages, land use change leading to water-based cultivation, and livelihood change and transboundary migration into hazardous areas. These could all be thought of as tipping points because there's a change, an anthropogenic change, which then has to be considered in terms of its impact on transmission of schistosomiasis or another neglected tropical disease. This is a, a broad framework. Then what happens is that that triggers a response by stakeholders, including researchers, but also programme directors and governments and NGOs, to look at some of the risk factors that might be present in that hazardous situation, and then to think about taking location-specific actions. 
Now, there's much more to that, of course, and, well, it could be a framework, but it has some issues. Yes, indeed, Bill. It is nicer graphic, and it is a bit blue sky thinking. And what funders would like to see is whether it's been done before. So is there any example of maybe multidisciplinary research in this area, or maybe actually some uh, location-specific actions based on understanding the risks? Well, I would point always back to this uh, program here, this uh, EU-funded program of which I was a part a few years ago. Healthyfutures.eu was a collection of researchers working across different domains to predict the future hazard associated with schistomyces mansoni in Africa. Never bettered, but I would say that. And we produced some uh, vulnerability maps suggesting how other vulnerability indicators, apart from just the climate itself, could affect future transmission potential. In terms of whether there has been some location-specific interventions based on a tipping point, this is an, uh, an example from China, where there was a, a tragedy. A cruise ship, the Oriental Star, sank into the Yangtze River. It's a known uh, Japonicum site. There are some pictures of the, uh, the sinking and the rescue. Most of the people on the ship unfortunately died, but 9,000 specialists were sent to that area, divers and other specialists. And that triggered a response in terms of uh, rapid assessment of the schistosmiasis risk to those workers as an occupational health risk. And the Delphi method was used, and the Delphi method is an iterative way of communicating between experts to reach consensus. So that method was then used to assess the risk of schistosmiasis transmission in that location at that particular time. So if we follow that example, we can think about transferring the idea to other locations where there might be the possibility or the, the, the mapping, for example, indicates there's a hazard, and then the hazard is then translated into a real risk profile, and then actions are taken based on a tipping point that's reached. What does Bill say? Call me, he says, because this is clearly an important area to fund. And at that, I will thank you for your attention and point you towards some papers.